Good morning, and welcome to worship on this 18th Sunday after the Pentecost. Uh, We're delighted to have you joining us uh, via video or uh, however you are are joining us this morning. We have also expanded our in-person worship uh, a little bit. There are now two services on Sunday morning. Uh, The conversation and communion service is going to be at 8. We had published 9 for folks. I hope that uh, folks get the message, but it was a little warm out there last week at 9. So we're going to do 8 o'clock conversation and communion communion today and and next week until it gets too cool to do that. And then there will be 10.30 worship in the sanctuary. And in the worship in the sanctuary, we've added some liturgical pieces via the video pieces, some of the same pieces that you'll see in this online worship uh, to be a part of that worship. So uh, we're still spaced uh, in a way that is safer and we are still masked in our worship. We still have special uh, procedures for cleaning and and sanitizing the sanctuary. So I do hope um, that uh, if you decide to to take part in those services, um, that you will remember to bring your mask, hopefully bring your own hand sanitizer uh, so that you can take communion and um, uh, those kinds of things. Um, Also, you probably got a letter in the mail this week, I hope you did, about Consecration Sunday. Uh, Consecration Sunday is set for November the 1st. Uh, It is our annual campaign to identify uh, our projected uh, giving for next year and how each of us chooses to estimate that giving for the next year. Um, You will hear more about it in the coming weeks as we celebrate our partnership with uh, any number of agencies and organizations which uh, help us to extend our ministry and outreach. This... um We celebrate during this time CTL's culture of generosity under the theme uh, (coughs) turning turning towards our neighbor in love, uh, which is the the theme that guides all of our our outreach at CTL. So uh, I I want everybody to be a part of that in some way, and you're going to get more information of how you can do that in the coming weeks. Today, uh, in our worship, uh, we are delighted to, to have uh, the Bell Choir as a part of our, uh, as our worship experience today. Uh, they've uh, masked up and distanced themselves and are presenting a, uh, a, a, an anthem for us, a, a prelude for us. And also, uh, Jill and uh, um, Lincoln have combined for a uh, duet, a piano organ duet. We always enjoy those. So with that, let's take this time now during the prelude and prepare ourselves for worship with a time of prayer and reflection.
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are active to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from dwelling in grace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to the light of you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, 
safe, comforts and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. Beloved God, from you come all things that are good. Lead us by the inspiration of your spirit to know those things that are right, and by your merciful guidance, help us to do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. from Isaiah, the fifth chapter. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine upon us, and we shall be saved. You have brought to mind out of Egypt. You cast out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered by its shadow, and the towering cedar trees by its boughs. You stretched out its tendrils to the sea, and its branches to the river. Why have you broken down its wall, so that all who pass by flood off its graves? The wild boar of the forest has 
rummaged it, and the beast of the field had raised upon it. Turn now, O God of hosts, look down from heaven. Behold and tend this vine, preserve what your right hand has planted. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the people, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and put up a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and he went into another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized the slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned yet another. Again, he sent other slaves more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And they said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants and will give him the produce at harvest time. And Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures that the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken into pieces, and it will crush anyone upon whom it falls." When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In April of this year, the National Geographic magazine published a flip issue. Basically, you know, two issues in one to explore two starkly different futures for our planet. One half of the magazine presented the worst case scenario. What planet Earth might look like in 50 years if we do nothing substantive about climate change. The writer described a grim, dangerous world of mass extinctions, searing forest fires, deadly heat waves, fierce storms, and widespread suffering for the human race. The other half portrayed a more hopeful, verdant vision. What planet Earth could look like if in 50 years, we harness our time and our energy, our resources and our technology to undo at least some of the damage that we have already done. And in this scenario, we would find sustainable ways to feed ourselves. We'd clean up the oceans, the rivers and the lakes. We'd provide carbon neutral energy for all. We'd reimagine our homes, streets, cities and corporations in light of the most pressing needs of the environment. We'd begin to reverse climate change and prevent many, if not all, extinctions. It's impossible to know who is right. Susan Goldberg wrote about the two contrasting visions in her editor's note for the issue. Now, 
I know that the parable of the wicked tenants, as our gospel lesson is popularly called, isn't straightforwardly about climate change or about the environment. And I know, too, that just like everything else today, you cannot talk about this subject without looking at it through blue lenses or red lenses so that it becomes a political football. Truth is, I don't want to advance a particular position on this subject today. I just think that raising questions about the stewardship of the earth, the environment, illustrates that the new tenets have continued in the same sinful ways as the old tenets. You remember how the Pharisees answered Jesus at the end of today's parable. They say, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. Other tenants. We have learned over the last couple of weeks that in the Bible, this vineyard is God's people, all of God's people. And Jesus tells this particular story to indict the religious leaders of the day for exploiting and mistreating God's people, God's vineyard. The parable is meant to expose the corruption in the religious elite and condemn their obsession with privilege, wealth, and power. Matthew, the gospel writer, suggests that the other tenants who will replace these wicked tenants are the followers of Jesus. We have become the other tenants, the new tenants. Today's gospel is a midrash on Isaiah's song, which was our first lesson for today. Now, a midrash is a way of handling scripture which the, the rabbis just loved then and now. It's a way of amplifying and interpreting and adapting the scripture in order to fill it out for a new time and new circumstances. So Jesus deliberately begins his parable with the same words that Isaiah, in our first lesson, used to describe how God establishes the vineyard with love and care. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug wine presses in it, and built a watchtower. In a further midrash for our time and our circumstances, it is no leap to say that human beings have a way of messing things up. The environment is just one example. Like the tenets in the story, we neglect to understand, or perhaps very deliberately choose to ignore, the fact that we are stewards rather than owners of the vineyard. When the landowner asks for his rightful share of the harvest, the tenants take offense, as if the vineyard belongs to them. And it is the landowner who's wrong for making a claim on the land at all. Somewhere along the way, the tenants have forgotten our place, our vocation, our standing in relationship to both the land and the landowner. To put it bluntly, we have forgotten that we own nothing, nothing at all. Everything belongs to the landowner. Ours is not a vocation of ownership. It is a vocation of caring, tending, safeguarding, cultivating, and protecting on behalf of another. And in doing so, to produce a harvest for the owner, God. A harvest, as Isaiah points out, not of sour grapes, but of good grapes. Specifically, Isaiah says, he expected justice but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. 
Have we not, like the tenets in the parable, deluded ourselves into thinking that we own the earth and all that is in it, when in fact we are meant to be stewards only? We must ask ourselves, will we, like the tenets, assume that God is absent or apathetic or uninvolved? And will we hoard the beauty and the bounty of creation for our own selfish ease, gain, comfort, and convenience? Will we embrace those who are in need, or will we shun them? Will we use our privilege to work for greater equity and justice for others, or to secure our own futures? Will we finally reach out to the Christ that we perceive in our neighbor, or only come to worship the Christ of the stained glass that adorns our sanctuaries? The good news in all of this is that our eternal salvation does not hang in the balance of how we answer these questions. We are saved by grace through faith for Christ's sake, still and always. It is the quality and the character of our lives as Christians and the quality and the character of the world in which we live, which hang in the balance. Now, it's worth noting here that Jesus does not describe the evildoers in this story as thieves or marauders. They are not outsiders. They are the landowner's trusted tenants. He chose them. He granted them a creative license to steward the vineyard for the benefit of all. Once, twice, three times the landowner appeals to the tenant's better nature to surrender to God the fruits of love, justice, goodness, mercy, and care to which God is entitled. The utterly illogical action of the owner in sending the son after the previous messengers were so violently rejected reflects the actions of a long-suffering and compassionate God. God again and again reaches out even when his chosen people reject the principles and the commandments of their God, even when we chase after other gods, replace justice with self-interest, goodness with greed, humility with self-aggrandizement, and love with shameless violence. I think a better title for today's gospel parable might be the long-suffering God, rather than the wicked tenants. Because in the end, you see, this parable is not about the wicked tenants, or the Pharisees, or Matthew's community, or even us. It is rather about God. God, the one who entrusted us with all good things, blessing us beyond the dreams of our grandparents. God, the one, even when disappointed by what we do with those blessings, yet comes to us in love. God, the one who weeps over the injustices of the world, embraces those who fall short, and promises to never, ever, give up on anyone, not on those tenants, not on Matthew's perchant for violent rhetoric, not even on us, when we refuse to recognize others, all others, as God's beloved children and instead view them as competitors or threats. Isaiah summoned the earlier tenants to justice 
and righteousness by learning to do good, redressing those who were wronged, hearing the orphans' pleas, and defending the widows. Those things of mercy, compassion, and justice are the marks of people who live in relationship with God. Because now that we know ourselves to be those whom God loves unabashedly and shamelessly, now that we know ourselves, that is, to be the ones for whom God is willing to risk everything, even his son, we are free. We are free to live with hope, courage, and generosity. Having been healed, we can now offer to heal others. Having been reconciled, we can be instruments of reconciliation. Having tasted the mercy of God's justice, we can risk ourselves in working for greater justice for others. And having been blessed beyond measure, we can be a blessing to those around us and to the earth over which we have been appointed stewards. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Holy God, you call us to work for peace and justice in your vineyard. Refresh the church with your life that we may bear fruit through work and service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for the abundant harvest of the earth. Bless and care for those whose hands bring the fruits of the earth to the tables of all who hunger. May we be inspired by your servants who care deeply for your creation. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Curb the impulses of greed and pride that lead us to take advantage of others. Grant that world leaders seek the fruits of the kingdom for the good and welfare of all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sustain all who suffer with the promise of new life. Assured of your presence, heal our pain and suffering and equip us to embrace all bodies aching for wholeness of mind, body, and soul. We call to mind those who are struggling today. For all who suffer from COVID-19, especially President Trump and First Lady Melania, we pray too for Kim and Marshall, Jackie, Katie, George, Sherry, Jaron, Rod, Ron, Tony, Patsy, Julia, Mary Lou, Mark, Barb and Dave, Stacy. For Tracy, Dave, Terry, Marilyn, Scott, Susan, George, Daniel, Pete, and the 33rd IBCT, Donna, Glenn E., Jory and Lester, Mike, Julie, Ryan and Connor, Joel. Marsha, Rick, Steve, Laura, Kirsten, Todd, Joe, Sandy, Ellen, Randy, Paul, Umberto, Tom, Karen, Debbie. Ellen, John, Larry, Lana, Monica, Cam, Joe, Mark, Joel, Jeff, Ken, 
Ollie, Jean, Donna, Jean, Ruth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all managers in our community and for all who seek employment. Give hope and a future to those who lack meaningful work, those who have been marginalized or abused in the workplace, and those who desire new opportunities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have sent before us these gifts of your good creation. Prepare us for your banquet. Nourish us with this rich food and drink, and send us forth to set tables in the midst of the suffering world. Through the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. He is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty, and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. 
And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we remember the Lord's death until he comes again. which our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The table is prepared. Come and eat. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace this day and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, gracious God, that you have once again fed us with food beyond compare, the body and blood of Christ. Lead us, us from this place, nourished and forgiven, in the your beloved vineyard, to wipe away the tears of all hunger and thirst. Guided by the example of Saint Jesus Christ and led by the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Mother of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life.
Go in peace and serve the poor. Thanks be to God. Thank you.